You're listening to Music Tectonics. Welcome back to Music Tectonics, where we go beneath the surface of music and tech. I'm your host, Dimitri Vitsa. I'm also the founder and CEO of Rock, Paper, Scissors, a PR firm that specializes in music tech. And I'm super excited this week. Um, we're going to get into an interview in the realm of music education, online education. And I, uh, I've been wanting to get to that topic. As you know, uh, dear loyal listeners, we've done a lot of podcasts on live streaming platforms and live streaming streaming as a new practice. We've done quite a few on remote collaboration um, apps and, and platforms. And uh, to me, this this step into lockdown, remote working, everything happening with this COVID-19 pandemic um, should include a piece on music education. But before we get to our guest uh, today in our interview, um, I wanted to make sure that you knew we just announced that we have launched the Music Tectonics Conference online. Uh, last year in 2019, we did the conference in LA um, in October. This year, October 27th and 28th, because of health concerns and still wanting to do um, something to bring everybody together, we've decided to move the event online. And we've been doing some really um, deep research into some platforms we think are going to make for an awesome interactive experience. Um, if you've ever heard of Chat Roulette, where you automatically get put on camera with a stranger across the world, um, that kind of got dark and scary. But when you're in a room full of colleagues, uh, it can be really awesome. So we've got this element of surprise and serendipity and delight that we're going to present to you during Music Tectonics, as well as having some amazing speakers ranging from Scott Cohen, the Chief Innovation Officer of Warner Music Group, the amazing music tech journalist. Sherry Hu from, from Water and Music. Um, we've got folks coming in from Roblox um, and a wide variety of other really cool platforms and companies, many of which you will recognize their names and some of which I think you'll find to be super great innovators there. So at the end of this podcast, I'll tell you more about the conference, but let's get to our interview today. Please welcome Tom's Russoffs from Solfeggio. Tom, how, Tom's, how are you doing today? Hi, guys. Uh Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm doing great. Yeah, so you're the CEO and co-founder of Solfeggio, which is a um, digital music education platform, which we're going to talk about. You're also an agile coach, so you've got the tech side, and you're also the founder of the first and largest music school for adults in Latvia, where you're calling in from today. Is that right? Uh, we're actually calling in from Solfeggio office, uh, but yeah, that's, that's quite, quite correct. Oh, I'm sorry. I meant calling in from Latvia, not from the music school. <laughs> oh, yeah, sure. Like I left music school a couple of years ago already. So I thought, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah but um, but it's cool because you have this background in music education. It sounds like a real grassroots uh, kind of setting. And then you also have this software development tech background as well that combine into this experience. Yeah, I, I used to did a lot of technology and I worked for huge telco in, in the region. I in Telis Honor, a group that's like like major telco in Scandinavia and uh, did a lot of technology for them as well. So yeah, I try to combine my passion with music with technology by building Solfeggio as well. Yeah. So tell us what Solfeggio is. Okay, so Solfeggio is a music education software and uh, what we do, we use popular music songs that students love and uh, would love to learn. Um, and we combine that with artificial intelligence technology and uh, multimedia technology and uh, we actually explain how the music works how the song works and how to play it on different music instruments and uh, the software is meant for schools so that we can make music lessons in schools more engaging more engaging and more students start to learn music also at home and so is this an app or is it a web platform or is it both so it is a web platform, as mostly in schools, you use computers and Chromebooks. Mm -hmm. Got it. And the thing that's unique, well, first of all, the interface looks really cool, but this, this aspect of learning music through pop songs <clears throat> is pretty unique. That seems like it's a differentiator for you guys. Yeah, this, is, this was the setup that we, we thought from the beginning, that we need to start with music that students actually want to learn they want to express themselves into this music. And yeah, we couldn't find any solution for schools uh, that would use this kind of setup. So tell us a little bit more about how it works, just so we can like step in as if we're, as if we're using it either as a teacher or a student. What, what's our experience? Okay, so 
as a teacher, you would sign up and you would see this library of popular, mu popular music. And uh, you would probably ask the kids, what song do you like uh, from the selection? And uh, they would choose one. And uh, then you would play it on, on, the, on the whiteboard or like the projector, uh, dig digital whiteboard. And, um, and what we have there is you see the notation floating on the screen in real time, synced in real time with audio and, and really, really nice quality sound. Uh, and then you can separate, you can separate vocals, you can separate guitar and actually listen how that guitar part in the song, in the song sounds. And at the same time, you see the notation or the chords and you can see the visualiz visualization, how to actually play that chord. And uh, we do that for multiple instrument instruments at the same time so that during a class setup, you can actually play music together, which is super important for schools. Yeah, that's really cool. So <clears throat> this ability to take a pop song and break it down to its separate parts, just like a regular band class would, would break down parts, but this is with a pop song, something they're already familiar with, and then to break out both the audio as well as the visualization. So the student, it's, it's, it's like if I was taking music lessons and I got to play music I actually liked. <laughs> yeah, that's the, that's the goal. <laughs> yeah. Got it. Um, and, and so are people typically using a projector? They're using a digital whiteboard or it's both? Um, I, we, we think it's both, but there's a lot of use cases around Chromebooks and iPads as well. And, uh, then you would split the class in the groups and, uh, do some group assignments, some individual work as well. And then all of the class just assembles together and starts playing music together. So there's a different use cases in world in, in using Solfeggio, but mostly it's true projector and white or digital whiteboard. Yeah. So what are some of your favorite stories from users and teachers that might give us a little more concrete vision of how this is getting used and, and what's happening as a result? Mm, that's a good question. So um, I think one of the favorites I have is around one teacher that said they had, she had really, really, really aggressive students in the class. And <laughs> We, we, we could call them bullies <laughs> and, <laughs> and, um, like the, like the top bully of the class, he was, he was given a home assignment with Solfeggio and, uh, I think it was, I, I cannot recall the, the song, the exact song that he learned, but, uh, teacher actually wrote an email to us and said that once, uh, the, the, the school bully tried out Solfeggio. Uh, he came back to the teacher and said that he learned it on guitar as this song and asked the teacher to not tell that to anyone ever. Mm. But he said that he felt more calm and peaceful after, after playing Solfeggio. And uh, that was a story that inspired our hearts for sure. <laughs> Wow, he wanted to protect his reputation as a yeah, tough guy, not exactly, somebody that actually yeah. <laughs> listened to what the teacher had to say. Yeah, and then the teacher told us. So, <laughs> I mean, you probably have lots of experiences as having having started this music school uh, even before this about the power of music in education settings. Yeah, so music is super. Learning music is super super important for child development and especially for teens. And it is proven that music. It increases grade, grades for for about 20%. It increases graduation chances for about 20%. And there's proven studies that it reduces aggression in children by 30%. So in short, music is super, super valuable for brain development and for emotional skills. And yeah, that's why we're doing that. That's why we want to inspire more and more kids to learn music. Did you have other stories from, from your favorite stories with Sol Solfeggio you want to share before I ask my next question? Well, actually, when we started Solfeggio, uh, it was around three years ago, um, there was, we tried out Solfeggio in one school and uh, five kids from that school, they actually started a pop band and they're oh, still nice. playing together. So yeah, that was also a super inspiring story. That's That's cool. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you go from practicing in school to all of a sudden it takes on its own momentum of its own and 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 people are making new music um that's pretty awesome yeah maybe there are more stories like that that we don't know because solfeggio is used by thousands of students but that was like really what 
kept our motivation going also in tougher periods. Let's get into a little bit more detail about what led you to starting this company. I mentioned that you have this past in, in technology and software and also this past in, in, in starting a music school in, in, in real life. Uh, wh what led you to start uh, Solfeggia? How did you get from there to, to here? It actually started in that music school that I founded. And uh, um, my co-founder, Lauma, uh, she was a guitar teacher and, and like band teacher in that, um, in that music school. And uh, together with her, we tried to figure out what are the ways that would engage more students and would keep their motivation going. And uh, we started this like experiments with technology and, and uh, we built, I would say like digital prototype of what Solfeggio is now, tried it out in our school. And uh, we learned that this technology really works and really gets the students to keep on playing, doing, keep on doing more homeworks and in, sh in short, it also, it decreases the time it takes to learn something. And uh, then we tried that out in regular, regular K-12 schools. And uh, that was when we realized that there's mm, huge need for th this kind of software in regular, regular music lessons. And um, yeah, that's how we realized that we need to build this as a more prominent tool that every every teacher in every regular school can use but you were you were doing this music school everything was fine why did you why did you want this additional software layer as part of the experience um i think it was i think it was an accident in 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 some way as we were lama's a teacher and she's just thinking how can i teach better and that was mm -hmm. kind of her initiative to do something extra and i'm a technology innovator and i'm thinking how can we solve a problem with a technology and then there was this spark and i tried out the the idea of how to present music to, to kids i tried it out myself and immediately saw like i could build a technology out of it and um yeah it was kind of like magic and that magic moment when you feel this feeling of like live band playing with you at your home and you can control it that was that was really a feeling that i still feel today three years maybe even more since that moment i can still feel that feeling and that's what i want to share with people around the world Cool. So let's talk about traction. Um, you guys won a the Meetem Lab 2020 competition uh, it, for the music creation and education category, which is very cool. I've been going to Meetem Lab for a few years. It's a it's a blast. I know this time it was online, um, but they do such a great job of kind of scanning the entire world and getting uh, applications from all sorts of <clears throat> excuse me a, a wide variety of. Um, different uh d different types of music tech platforms and uh i'm sure you know we'd love to hear how that that experience was but i'm also just curious how how's traction been for solfeggio okay so solfeggio currently is used in more than ten thousand schools i think we just this month we hit our ten thousand wow. school and uh um, congrats yeah i think the biggest growth actually came this spring um uh, right before uh, participating in MIDEM and it was also partially due to COVID and a lot of teachers realizing they need technology help to conduct their lessons and uh, they need to do a lot more, inspire kids to do a lot more homework and um, yeah it's it's been like it's been huge growth I think especially for the past one year of Solfeggio yeah yeah, that's great. That's that's incredible. Uh, how do you, how do schools find out about you? What I mean, what are you doing to get into schools? All of this traction is actually made without investing anything in marketing. So schools find uh, about us organically. They look for uh, look for tools like ours to solve their problems, and um, we're just really trying to figure out what are the problems of teachers they're facing. And we're trying to address our, those problems with our software, and um, then they find us. <laughs> Got it. Wait, what's the pricing and business model for Solfeggio? So we have we have a free plan with some limitations, but it's still accessible 
to most of the schools that maybe don't have the budget to pay for the dedicated software. We want the scope and uh, the impact that we uh, deliver to the world to be as meaningful as possible. And then we have a paid plan for schools, uh, which is, there's two plans. One's $250, one is $899, $899. And um, the difference is the amount of songs you get and the amount of artificial intelligence support you get. And um, then there are also student plans that students can use um, to sign up for, for some classes individually. I want to ask you a little more about some of the things you just mentioned. Um, when you say the number of songs, are these songs um, the same songs we'd hear on the radio or on Spotify, or are they re-recordings yeah. of pop so songs? So we're not using originals because original songs uh, very often do not have separation of tracks available. And that's important for education so that you can actually hear each of the parts of the song separately. And um, right. we're, we are re-recording them in our studio where I'm actually talking from now. And um, yeah, uh, these are the songs you hear in the radio, but it also depends what is the publisher. And uh, we're not using songs from all of the publishers. We're using songs from the ones that we have contracts with. Gotcha. Okay. So, wow, you're recreating each song and including vocals or are there no vocals in them? Yeah, there are also vocals in the songs, and uh, yeah, we order vocals, but we're not doing vocals uh, locally. Yeah, we're ordering them from our partners. Oh, that makes sense. Okay, cool. Um, and you keep you've mentioned artificial intelligence a couple of times. What is the role that AI plays in Solfeggio? Okay, so AI is like a support for the teacher, and uh, AI helps to explain the topics when the teacher is not there or if the student needs a different pace for explaining those topics so for example he does not get that topic immediately and then our ai is there to help and guide the student to understand that topic better is i mean is solfeggio listening to their performance and then interpreting where they are and what lessons they need or more just in terms of the pace as they're going through um, it'll make decisions about going back over certain sections of the song. Um, it's more around the topics they discover through the song. And uh, for example, they learn about rhythm and how the rhythm works in the song. And uh, our art artificial intelligence is there to explain how the rhythm works and uh, to test whether the student has understood the topic and does the the student needs some extra information about this topic or does he need to repeat that topic? So that's more like how, how it works. How does it know that the student needs more information about rhythm, for example? It does some what? tests there. and um, Like asking questions, like survey? Yeah, there are different types, types of methodologies we use there, but yeah, you can, you can call them tests. Yeah. yeah. Okay, interesting. So that sounds like a differentiator from probably other music education programs. I haven't heard of any that are using AI to test test students and then deliver them stuff. The fact that you're using pop music we talked about, the, probably the, the, the very labor-intensive and, and expensive process of recording original tracks with stems is probably a differentiator. Are there any other ways in which Solfeggio differs from other music education programs, both offline and online? Um. The ones you mentioned are correct, but yeah, I think you mentioned another one very early in the conversation and that's user interface. And we try to deliver this feel that that's something like uh, like Spotify or Apple Music you're using. That, that's, that's an experience you're familiar with and students really love it. Yeah, it, I mean, I've been to the website. It looks, and, and seen the demo videos. It does look very clean, very beautiful, and it does not, does not feel like school, does it? It feels it feels like something else. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, how have things changed since the COVID uh, nineteen lockdowns and remote schooling starting? All that kind of thing. So I I'll, I already mentioned that a lot of teachers got put into a situation where they really need some help and right. technology 
uh, to deliver the lessons. And yeah, we saw an explosive growth um, in our signups and usage rates. Uh, at the same time, we think that COVID was kind of like a Kickstarter of bigger movement and realization that teachers role is not to like read the book in front of the student. I think a lot of people know that, but um, sometimes it's you, someone has to read that book <laughs> in front of mm -hmm. the student. And uh, there is a lot of lot that technology can help and deliver instead of the teacher while the teacher can focus on helping the student where the student needs particularly extra help. Yeah. Are you, are you a part of a community of other folks that are involved in music education? Are there trade groups, conferences, newsletters? I'm curious what the conversations there have been in the last few months. Yeah. So we're, we're a big part of music teachers community because our mission is to support the teacher and give him the tools that he needs. And we're listening a lot to our users and we're listening a lot to the community of music teachers. And I, if I would have to describe the feeling there, then it's actually, it's chaotic because there's a lot of confusion around how the lesson is going to happen uh, mm -hmm. next year. How the school going to start? Are we going to do classroom or online lessons? Um, what types of methodologies I should use? And what we're doing here uh, to help is to be the like the voice of calm and reason and, and say, there is a methodology you can use. And this is how we have shown that it's being done successfully and we can help you. Are you seeing variations from region to region of the world? I don't know how, how far spread you are in the, in the planet right now with, with Solfeggio, but I'm curious if you're seeing differences in how um, different, different uh, countries and, and cultures are, are approaching this, this, this challenging time. Yeah, I, there's certainly differences in the scale COVID has changed things and, and like how well the situation has been handled in different countries and and how lucky some countries have been or unlucky in, in that sense. But I think um, the general feeling is the same around the world, that there's a lot more learning possible digitally. There are benefits of that. The, it should happen digitally. And um, there's... No turning back from that, even when COVID ends. I think that's the feeling that we get around the world. Yeah, yeah. No, I think you're right. That, that it, 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 there have been different moments in this worldwide experience where you're like, oh, when's this going to end? And then you realize, well, it's not going to stay exactly the same uh, as it is during COVID, uh, the pandemic, but it's also not going to go back to normal ever again. Things are permanently changed for, yeah. for so many things. And I think education is one of them. Um, yeah, and sure. here, in, he, yeah, here in the U S right now, schools are, some schools are starting to open up. Some of the earlier schools are starting to open up and some of them are opening up for one day, seeing a COVID case and then closing immediately. And so everyone's still grappling with the distance learning thing. Um, and, and music is a tough thing to, to teach remotely. <laughs> so it is, but yeah, it's, that's why our mission has always been to be both in the classroom and help the teacher in the class and also to be present at home and help students learn at home. And, and, uh, it's certainly much easier if you have tools to help you with. Yeah. So you mentioned earlier, um, that you've got contracts with certain publishers. How are you handling publishing? Let's get a little more into that since we've got a kind of a B2B audience that's always interested in the mechanics of the, uh, legal and business relationships. Um, so tell us sort of how, how that's being handled and, and how that's, um, uh, how that's affected, you know, you, the scope of your catalog and things like that. And then also let's talk a little bit about, um, this as a potential revenue stream that didn't exist before. Yeah. So there's, there's not a big rocket science behind that. We're just approaching labels and, um, signing contracts and we have contracts with uh, largest publishers were soon going to strike a deal with another 
major label and that's going to allow us to expand our library library a bit more as well and um yeah we're just open to conversations with any label that it's actually not labels it's publishing companies that we're working with yeah right it's the publishers. and we're mm-hmm. we're open to talk with any publishing company that that's interested in having a revenue stream uh from from our what we do and um yeah that's that's just talking with publishers <laughs> not, not Nothing to yeah. there. I, I, what kind of reaction are you getting? Are people b- being po- uh, ex- enthusiastic or are they hesitant? So I would say it was super, super difficult to get the, fil- the, the first deal. And I think we, we were in mid them two times and met with a lot of people and, and got a lot of connections, but still couldn't strike a deal. And um, it was really one of the largest publishers that we talked to and got a really nice conversation about what we're doing, why we're doing that, that allowed us to strike the first deal. And from that on, it was a lot easier conversation and it was still difficult, but then we won met them and that helped a lot as well. <laughs> oh yeah. That's cool. So even since you won the Medium Lab this year, you're seeing a, a, a more enthusiastic response. Yeah. A lot more enthusiastic. Yeah. <laughs> Huh, that's good. Um, do, h- how about this revenue stream for songwriters, composers, and publishers? Is is there how how significant do you think this could be in this type of um, use case? That's that's actually a difficult question because I don't know exactly how much of the revenue the publishers are sharing with the artists themselves. Well, let's just stick with publisher then. I mean, is there, is this, is this? I mean, is that part of your ca- your the case that you make for publishers is that this it's unlocking this revenue stream and and how do you present to them what the potential is that it's worth it for them to spend the time on doing these contracts and deals and opening up their um, compositions and songs to this new way of being mm-hmm. used. Um, so the publishers we talk to they really see the use case really well and and they're pretty confident on the numbers that we're presenting and 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 yeah this is for sure going to be a like a huge growth uh, for music education space that we're kind of creating with this software but it's also i think it's really interesting revenue revenue stream for publishers because we're creating new artists as well then we're creating new consumers of music and and so on but um i think yeah i think for publishers that's maybe it's also a question of why not (laughs) why shouldn't we participate in this growing business and why shouldn't we participate in this growing market because again music education space and like this technology space it's it's estimated to grow 60 percent per year um year over year and yeah why not (laughs) Yeah. You know, it's interesting. This is the first time I've had this thought, you know, we're watching these TikTok and Triller and these user generated content videos that are using music and audio from these user generated, you know, social media video makers, influencers and so forth that um, there isn't a whole lot of choice about who's using your video, how and so forth. But it's almost like we're this this when you get to this level of engagement with existing pop songs where a user let's say or a fan is enjoying it so much that they're learning to play it it's not it's kind of on the same spectrum as these tiktok users right like if you talk about fan engagement how much how much more fan engagement could you have than your fans wanting to play your songs like literally learn the guitar line and the drum line and the synth and the vocals you can't really it's it's interesting to think about kind of like We've gone from this place where music was in this kind of boxed up place to where it's, or you go to the extreme where it's like, well, everyone's sampling everybody, every, everybody's stuff and remixing it in various mediums and, and so forth. And then right where you are is kind of like the convergence point. Yeah, <laughs> we actually think that's amazing. I think any expression of yourself and your talents, it, it, that could be dancing in TikTok, that could be playing a music instrument. In... In all of those cases, yeah, you relate with music in a much deeper level. And we think that's beautiful. We that's why we're here. Yeah. 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 Cool. So um 
I've not had somebody from Latvia on the on the show before. I'm curious what it's like there, what it's like running your company, anything that our listeners should know kind of about if they're not familiar with Latvia, about the country, about the culture, and how that influences your trajectory. Okay. So in terms of weather, we're like kind of like Boston. We're we're part of Learn Launch Accelerator for ed, ed tech companies uh, in Boston. And uh, mm-hmm. we've mm-hmm. been there a couple of times. And yeah, it's similar weather. So in terms of music, I think what's important about Latvia is that we have this deep cultural DNA about music and about creating music. So we have these singing and dancing festivals that happen every four years where like hundreds of thousands of people, well, thousands, tens of thousands of people gather together and sing. <laughs> and um, that's very unusual for, I'm not, I'm not thinking how that would happen in COVID situation, but like, yeah, anyways, right. that's really like a beautiful festival that's been part of our DNA for years. And then we have these uh, music schools, one of the that I found as well, that a lot of a lot of kids attend during their school age and that makes a lot more pro- larger proportion of population ready to do music, ready to create music. And we have composers like Peter Svask, who, who are like world famous. We have conductors like uh, Nelson's, uh, who is actually conducting Boston uh, Orchestra. And um, yeah, these are like, I think Latvia, Latvia's DNA is just like really, really connected with music. Hmm. And are you, how, how, how global is your reach right now with Solfeggio and, and uh, how is it running the company from Latvia and getting, getting traction and reaction from other parts of the world? Sorry, can you repeat the question? Yeah. I, oh, yeah. So, so I was curious how many countries Solfeggio is in and what it's like when people first hear from you and know that you're in Latvia, what, what kind of reactions you get um, for this kind of cool music education company coming from where you are. Um, so we think of ourselves as a global company. And uh, since we're, most of our investors are actually from Sweden, which is also a uh, very musically themed country as well. And there's a lot of pop stars coming from Sweden, like, like, uh, um, yeah, Zara Larsson, for example. And, uh, our investors are from the United States as well, like Learn Launch. Um, we're, we have this like very international team, very international approach for things. So I don't think we get any kind of impressions or, or special recognition. Yeah because we're from Latvia, but, um, in terms of the global reach, um, there's a limitation of, uh, global countries we can serve, uh, due to publishing contracts that we have, but we have interests and like signups for also some free music that we have in our, in our app, like that we have created ourselves. We have interest Mm -hmm. from more than 100 countries and, and yeah, this is, Yeah, our goal is to help and impact people uh, globally for sure. That's awesome. That's great. Well, I just have a couple more questions for you before we wrap up. Um, And I kind of want to broaden out first and then also just talk about your future trajectory. How do you think access to music education like this via the internet and apps will change the world? How do you think it's going to change the music industry over time? I think it's, it's a lot about approachability and and uh, accessibility of music education and mm-hmm. there are 1.3 million students in the United States that do not actually have access to music education in their school they don't have music programs and uh, we right. feel that's sad and uh, we want to change that and uh, with technology and our technology we can actually offer these schools a lot more cost efficient way to run really really high quality music programs and um I think technology is there to help people become better if that if the technology is used in a way that's useful for humanity and, and people. So yeah, that would be my answer yeah. to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, it's interesting because um 
you know, I think one of the big, biggest seismic shifts in the music space, both for listeners and for creators and for in the recording industry as well, is that the 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 me- means of production are now in the hands of the masses, and the there's the beginning element of that is understanding how to make music, right? And then there's the technology that goes with it, whether it's the instruments or the recording, um, the technology and that sort of thing. But I think uh, what we're seeing with this connected world through the internet is that more and more people do have access to creating. Now, I'm not saying it's all been solved, that we all have equal access to make music or learn music or have recording technology, things like that. But um, but you're at the front end of that by just t- teaching people how to play music. So um, I think that's that's a huge change that we've been undergoing. And when people talk about how tough it is in the music industry today, one of the reasons it's so tough is because you're blurring the lines between who's the creator and who's yeah, the listener. Definitely. Uh, and, and and you have this this level of engagement where it's less about are you selling music to somebody or are people learning how to make their own? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> and what what we've seen in the industry, we have seen that large players like Spotify or Apple Music, they they see that as well that that more and more music is going to be produced uh, by regular people who are just doing that or starting that in their own home studios. And uh, there was like recent purchase of Soundtrap, which is one of the largest like music creation software, online softwares. Uh, and uh, yeah, like I think Spotify bought it for it. And uh, they see that this is really a trend. And uh, before you can start creating music, you actually have to learn to, to do music and understand music. And yeah, that's, I think like, like a beautiful ecosystem growing uh, digitally and, and inspiring a lot more people to do music. Yeah. Awesome. So one last question, where, where do you see the future of Solfeggio going from where you are now? Where do you see yourself in three or five or 10 years? So even though the number of schools I told you sounds like, wow, that's a, like a big growth in, in just a few years. Um, we, we're actually just in tiny part of the schools of the USA. And, uh, USA is 50% of our, our schools, but it's still not the impact that we want to we wanna deliver. And, and um, in three years, um, we hope that all, I would say like majority of the schools in in, in United States benefit from Solfeggio. And then we're also looking um, yeah, to outside markets as well. And there's some like great potential markets also to the east side, east side of the world. Awesome. Well, great. Uh, Tom's, it's been really fun to have you on. Congrats on your win at Meetem Lab. Congrats on all the the traction you have. And uh, really cool to see what you're up to. I appreciate you coming on to the the podcast today. Thank you very much for reminding me. And thank you for joining us on Music Tectonics. Uh, Please hit subscribe on your favorite podcasting app. Come to musictectonics.com and find out about the conference, the online conference, October 27th and 28th. Tickets are on sale. Super cheap, only $59, much cheaper than what we were able to do when we were in person because we don't have to rent a hotel and get catering, but we're still going to make it an incredible experience. Also, check out our app in both the iOS and Google Play Android stores. Um, The Music Tectonics app is a community for music tech innovators, founders, collaborators, and so forth, where you can ask questions, keep up on the news, and so forth. Thanks again for joining me. We'll be back with more episodes soon. You're listening to Music Tectonics.